Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to this uh, special occasion when we are introducing uh, Dr. Weech's book, Chinese Dreams in Romantic England, The Life and Times of Thomas Manning. My name's Tim Barrett. Until about 10 years ago, I was a professor of East Asian history in SOAS, and um, that was a pretty broad remit. And one of the things that I was interested in doing is trying to find my own place in history, as it were. Um, how had the knowledge of China developed in this country? Uh, what was it that was my own heritage as someone interested in China myself? And it was in that context that I first came across the name Thomas Manning. And I was immediately struck by his individuality. In fact, I wrote at the time, and this is uh, something like 30 years ago, um, he reminded me of the ancient Chinese poet who said, all the world is drunk and I alone am sober. He was remarkably far-sighted for his time. Um, and uh, it's perhaps appropriate that we revisit his life at this point, because we're, as uh, most of you will know, we're coming up to the bicentenary of this uh, Royal Asiatic Society. Uh, next year is the bicentenary of the founding. The year after that is the bicentenary of our Royal Charter. So uh, now is the time to look back to the uh, to those to whom we should show gratitude because they were the ones who brought this society into being. And of course, uh, that was a group that extended uh, way beyond uh, persons interested in Chinese studies, Sanskritists and um, whoever. But um, there were three people uh, in particular who um, represented, at one point, more or less the sum of knowledge about China existing in the British Isles at that time, um, at least as far as uh, people who had uh, some knowledge of the Chinese language were concerned. And I'd, I'd like to briefly, before handing over to Dr. Weech, uh, introduce the other two. Um, the oldest, well, not the oldest, but the first to become engaged in Chinese studies was Sir George Staunton, Jr. Uh, his father, also called Sir George, had been on the McCartney Embassy at the end of the 18th century, and young Sir George was a page. So he had the opportunity to learn Chinese as a child. Uh, now, as a baronet, of course, um, he saw, well, certainly his father saw his future life as one of public service. And um, uh, he, his father insisted, for example, that they speak only in Latin, uh, because that, that was the sort of thing that a chap would need to know in public life in those days. And Sir George did indeed uh, pursue a very distinguished career um, and, and did a great deal um, to uh, smooth the way between um, the Empire of China and Great Britain. Um, not 100% successfully, as you may recall from your history of the early 19th century, but um, it's perhaps unfortunate that, that he, his, his remarks did not carry the weight that they should have done in when he became a member of parliament and so forth. For one thing, he was small, and small people don't get the respect they ought to. The other, the, the, the other was that having lived a, a, a much of uh, uh, his, well, many of his formative years in um, a Chinese environment, he tended to bow a lot. And this was thought of as slightly ridiculous. Uh, he, 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 he seemed to be, a, as it were, a, a piece of living chinoiserie. Uh, and so he wasn't given the credit that was due to him. Now, last year, Henrietta Harrison came out with a book about him and his role as an interpreter, which I do recommend to you um, as an introduction, not simply to Sir George Staunton, but to the vital role that his friendship with um, at least one Chinese fellow interpreter uh, played in, uh, in the very early days of uh, Sino-British relations. Uh, so he was one of um, our founders. Uh, the second, who, who was in fact um, less instrumental in the sense that he was 
too busy in East Asia to um, play much of a role in London, although he did spend some time here, um, was the missionary Robert Morrison. Um, and um, the motivating um, factor here was not a public service, but um, uh, missionary zeal, uh, unlimited zeal. He, he, his achievements are quite staggering in terms of dictionaries and uh, translations of the Bible, you name it. Um, he, he managed to get it done in a relatively short life. He died uh, exhausted, more or less, in 1834, I think. Uh, um, and he was only born in 1782, if memory serves. And um, a few years ago, 2013, um, Chris Daly um, produced a very interesting book about his background. Um, because, of course, there are a lot of... Uh, books by by those with a missionary interest in, in, in Morrison's achievements. But um, Chris Daly looked back at his intellectual formation, and, and that um, turned out to go back through his Bible college, uh, essentially to the Scottish Enlightenment. And it brought uh, to bear on, on the situation where he, he was the first Protestant missionary in China, a certain openness to Chinese civilization, which I'm afraid one has to say that the influence of the Scottish Enlightenment did not persist in missionary circles. I, I mean, the missionary endeavor got underway um, uh, through his efforts and those uh, of his uh, younger and later colleagues. But uh, I must say that the um, intellectual background uh, that, that formed him um, seems to have faded, alas. Uh, now, Thomas Manning was a very different person. He did not in any way um, aim to achieve public prominence. He had public spirit, but he preferred, I don't know if Ed will mention this, he, he preferred where he engaged in um, public discourse to do it anonymously. He was, as it were, a private gentleman. But what was he doing getting uh, interested in China? Um, especially since he was 10 years older than the other uh, couple of people I've just mentioned. And he already had an established career as a mathematician in Cambridge and a mathematics tutor. He didn't take a degree for, because of religious scruples. You'll recall that only Anglicans could take degrees at the beginning of the 19th century, at least in Cambridge, uh, and indeed at University College, where things were a little freer, uh, didn't really become established until slightly later. So uh, here is someone who has the qualifications to be a Cambridge Don, but is, is making a private living. And um, somehow he becomes interested in China, not as part of a uh, public career, nor as part of being zealous um, in any missionary sense. He just wanted to know what this civilization might mean. Uh, I'm not going to say any more, because really it, it's for Dr. Weech to, to tell us uh, what he's discovered. Now, uh, I, I will admit that I, I'm amongst those here who has toyed with... Um, the writings of Thomas Manning, but um, and, and, until his whole archive, uh, such as had been preserved by his family, uh, became public largely through the efforts of the Royal Asiatic Society as well as the family itself, um, we there was very little one could say about him to to get a a real perspective on the man, and yet, and yet. We know that he was somebody who really impressed his contemporaries and, and his peers. And when I say his contemporaries and his peers, I don't mean just nobodies, not, not just the uh, local Norfolk gentry or whoever. I mean people like Coleridge, like, like, like um, Southey, like uh, especially Charles Lamb, who knew him very well and esteemed him as an equal of anybody he ever met. Now, so this, uh, this was a person who... 
it took more than a mere sinologist to get the measure of. We really needed somebody uh, to look at this man in the context of his times and in the context of such a peer group as this. Um, and I am glad to say that in my opinion that this work has now been done. Uh, the book that we're introducing um, is based on a PhD, uh, and it was a thorough PhD. But let me tell you, uh, before handing over uh, to, to the man who wrote it, that this doesn't read like a PhD. Now, some of us have read plenty of PhDs in our time, and uh, one wouldn't want to put the ordinary PhD on anybody's Christmas list, but this book you can safely put on any Christmas list. Um, it's uh, it's written in such a way that at last it does justice to an extraordinary man. And, and, and with that, I'm going to hand over because I'm not the one to explain this. It's Dr. Weech who's going to tell you all about this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tim, um, and thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Um, I'm not going to speak at, at great length, um, but I'd like to take about 20 minutes um, to thank some people um, and then to briefly summarise the book's most important and exciting findings, which Tim has already touched upon. Um, I've been working on Thomas Manning now for uh, about eight years in one way or another, um, and over that time, I've received support, advice, encouragement from a great many people, um, more than I could thank in the book or, or certainly this evening. Um, but I would like to start by thanking Tim again, um, both for his generous introduction this evening and for encouragement and advice over many years now. Um, when I started working on Thomas Manning, few people had written about him in any detail. And most of those who had were scholars of Romanticism, which, of course, is a larger academic field than British Sinology. Um, but Tim is one of the few British Sinologists to have written about Thomas Manning. And I think this has given you a unique perspective, um, which helps explain enormous insight and intellectual sympathy with which you um, have brought to the subject. Um, in researching this book, I was very conscious uh, that I was standing on the shoulders of Tim and other scholars who have studied Manning in previous years. And I particularly like to thank Anne Lonsdale, um, who I'm delighted to join us this evening. Um, and also Lawrence Wang Chi Wong um, from the universe, Chinese University of Hong Kong, who's not here tonight, um, but I did heavily rely on his research, focusing on Manning's activities during his time in the Far East, which had been a bit of a black box to me before that. And of course, I'd like to thank all my friends and colleagues at the Royal Asiatic Society, um, especially Alison Ota and Nancy Charlie, um, the Society's archivist who catalogues Manning's papers, um, and also Peter Robb, Tony Stockwell, Gordon Johnson, and Sarah Ansari, who served as presidents of the Society while I've been working on this project. I completed the research um, that the book is based on while studying for a doctorate at SOAS, and, was ex and I was extremely fortunate to have wonderful supervisors and examiners in uh, Bernard Fuhrer, Lars Larman, Felicity James, Peter Kitson, and Gregory Dart. And I think some of them, I know some of them are here this evening. I haven't said hello to you all yet. Um, I'd also like to thank Manchester University Press for publishing my book, uh, and Rian Davis, um, who I'm hoping you'll all meet this evening when you buy a copy, um, who has been running the publicity campaign. Um, and in particular, I also have to thank my editor, Emma Brennan, who is not here tonight, but without her, this book would never have been published. I owe her a great deal. Um, I've been privileged to meet several members of Manning's family 
um, over the past years. Um, and I've come to understand what an important place Thomas Manning has played in the family history. I know that his family did more than anyone else to keep his memory alive. Um, and I'm grateful to them for all of their support. Um, and I'm especially pleased that Deborah, Byron, and Anna, Sophia, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> are here tonight, um, and also Vicky and Mark. Um, um, I'd like to also to mention my debt of gratitude to Robert and Mike Manning, um, who are sadly no longer with us, but were both very generous uh, with their knowledge um, during my research. Uh, most of all, I like to thank my family who've encouraged me for the better part of a decade while I've been researching and writing about Thomas Manning and talking to them about what I've what I've discovered. Um, and in particular, um, and especially my wife, Trinity, um, for all her support and patience while I completed my PhD and then this book. Um, and the book, of course, is dedicated to her. Um, Thomas Manning was born in 1772 in Broome, Norfolk, and second son of an Anglican priest. Um, he attended Cambridge for five years, where he was an outstanding mathematician that could not graduate, as Tim alluded to, because he refused to take the religious tests, which were necessary then to receive a degree. He had been infused by the French Revolution, which took place in his late teens, um, and he was committed from a young age to a vision of social and political reform. He did not, however, become a political activist, but instead developed a scholarly plan to study the civilizations of the Far East. While living in Cambridge, Manning befriended a young Quaker poet called Charles Lloyd, who introduced him to the romantic essayist Charles Lamb. Uh, through Lamb, Manning made uh, the acquaintance of other members of the Romantic movement and became involved in discussions around the publication of lyrical ballads by William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, which of course was a seminal moment in history of British Romanticism and literary history in general. And um, Tim has mentioned that in 1800, Chinese culture uh, and history uh, not to mention language, was largely unknown to British audiences, um, despite the fact that Britain imported huge quantities of Chinese goods, mainly tea, but also silk and ceramics. Manning's ambition to visit China and study its social life was complicated by the fact that Europeans were not allowed to enter the country. But Manning did nevertheless spend about 10 years in Asia, and most uh, much of that time was in Canton, the Chinese port where all trade with Europe was conducted. Um, and there he made significant progress learning to read and speak the Chinese language. His efforts to enter the interior of China led him to an attempt an overland journey from India via Tibet in the company of a Chinese assistant named Zhao Xinjiao. They reached Tibet's capital, Lhasa, where Manning met the Dalai Lama. Um, but the Chinese authorities would not allow them to proceed any further. He returned to Canton and was later appointed as an interpreter to the British Amherst Embassy to Peking in 1816. During the return journey to England, he survived shipwreck and enjoyed an interview with Napoleon when his ship called at St. Helena. Um, but much to the frustration and bewilderment of his friends and admirers, um, he never published any accounts of his travels or his research when he returned to England. Um, he did, however, prepare a narrative of his journey to Lhasa for the benefits of his family, um, which was published 35 years after his death. The only thing Manning had ever published on China was an anonymous translation of Chinese jokes. Um, most of Manning's archive was misplaced during the 20th century, and the absence of primary sources meant it was impossible, um, really, for anyone to compose a complete biography. Much of the research for this book was based on an archive of Manning's letters and notebooks, which was rediscovered in 2014 and is now at the RAS, 
and it was digitized about five years ago and is all available online. Um, it uses these materials in addition to other sources to furnish the first attempt at a comprehensive overview of, of his remarkable career. Historians of Romanticism and Exploration um, have long been curious about Manning, um, and in recent decades, he has attracted special interest due to the fact, as Tim alluded to, that his reasons for wanting to learn about China were secular and humanist, which makes him more attractive in the terms of contemporary values. From what we know, or what we knew, he seems not to have been motivated by imperialism, trade, or missionary religion. But Manning was guarded about revealing his motivations and purpose. Uh, he was a private man, and historians only had recourse to a handful of public and semi-public statements, um, such as uh, this letter, or a letter to Joseph Banks, um, president of the Royal Society, um, sent when Manning was preparing his journey to China in 1806. And you can see beyond the obnoxious an intrusive message. Um, it's, uh, he's saying, um, having long been struck with the want of conformity in the opinions of men relative to the ancient history of China, um, I many years ago formed the design of attempting to explore the country myself and by my own observations and researches to dissipate some of the obscurity and doubt which hangs over his history. So to compose a first-hand um, study, basically. Um, in the account which he gave to his family and um, that was published after his death, he went into a little more detail um, and he said he wanted to reveal a moral view of China, its manners, the actual degree of happiness the people enjoy, their sentiments and opinions, literature, history, causes for their stability and vast population, which has long been a source of curiosity for people in, in the West. Um, and what there might be in China worthy to serve as a model for imitation and what to serve as a beacon to avoid. Interesting as they are, these statements did little to explain the powerful obsession which drove Manning to such enormous lengths and compelled him to sacrifice so much, in which everyone who's really studied his career in any detail has been struck by. Um, there were naturally high hopes that the new archive might shed further light on this mystery. Um, sure enough, amid a large amount of fascinating material, the single most arresting source turned out to be an almost illegible rough draft of a letter which Manning wrote to his father in December 1810. At the time, Manning was waiting for permission to enter Bhutan and begin his journey to Tibet. Unaware that his father had already passed away, Manning sought to explain why he wanted to learn about China. The first reason was as follows. I pursue my studies chiefly upon language and the metaphysics of language, i.e. the metaphysics of the human mind, and have unraveled a great many very curious things. I had many new trains of ideas upon this and a variety of other subjects before I left England. I scarcely ever mentioned them to anyone. The study of the Chinese has been of infinite service to me in these speculations and vice versa. I mention it now for the second time in my life to show you that I am not wandering at random without a real object. What I have in my mind is so much beyond what I could persuade people to expect that I won't mention it. But this wasn't all, um, he continued. This business of language and metaphysics is only my secondary object. What is my first? I can't speak of the first any more than I could speak of the other 10 years ago. I can't yet prove my pretensions. The example of a reform on the conduct of life is my object and has been ever since I was 18 or sooner. And China and Japan being the only countries worth inquiring about, his words not mine, where the real state of society is unknown, I do much wish to see one of those countries. For well, as their language, though no better a language than the English, may elicit metaphysical truth, so their mode of life 
though no better than 20 others, may elicit moral truths. So these extraordinary objectives provide completely new context for how we think about the study of Asia in late Georgian England. Manning's metaphysical investigations were part of a wider European tradition dating back through the 18th century that sought to use new methods of empirical research to find a scientific basis for moral intuitions deriving from Christian universalism about our common human nature. His idea that the study of Chinese or Japanese civilization might be useful to reform, uh, to, in, to inform a reform on the conduct of life, both reflected and would have contributed to the relativization of British culture in an increasingly global world. It reveals the cosmopolitan aspects of British Romanticism, which Sir Isaiah Berlin highlighted as one of the movement's key contributions to intellectual history. In the context of Georgian England, it was a profoundly radical plan, which shows how I, ideas about Asia could be involved with bold and ambitious schemes for progressive social change. The British Empire, of course, was a major part of the historical context, but imperialism was clearly not the only factor shaping how British people engaged with the outside world. Um, through his friendship with Charles Lamb, Manning has often been considered an adjacent figure to the Romantic movement who helped shape Romantic ideas about China. Yet the more I learned about Manning's project, the more I was struck by similarities between his goals and those of William Wordsworth. And it surprised me because Manning criticized the new direction for British poetry laid out in the second edition of Lyrical Ballads when Wordsworth abandoned the convention to rely upon the real language of men and incorporated apparently mundane scenes from everyday life. Manning disliked this, and he complained that to gravely tell us of a sheep drawn out of a hole and chronicle the beggar's tuppenny mishap was foolish stuff inappropriate for poetry. But this did not mean he was indifferent to the sympathies of men, and Manning shared the democratic conviction that the humble ways of ordinary people were a worthy subject for investigation and high culture. In his youth, Manning ranged across England, Wales, and the south of France, and sought to understand the manners and customs of the rural poor. Somewhat naively, this was what he hoped to do in China, and, and he imagined that it might provide the raw material for a comparative study of their social life, which could elicit moral truths. Like Wordsworth, Manning was influenced by Genevan philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in whose writing local habits and customs were imbued with a virtue and dignity they were not granted in mainstream Enlightenment philosophy. <coughs> I'm hoping not to hear any howls of protest from the Romanticists in the audience at this point my bowderization of Wordsworth. Um, but Manning's project for a reform on the conduct of life was to be based on studying the sympathies, opinions, manners, and customs of ordinary people. Here, I see a strong resemblance with Wordsworth's ultimate goal, which was to be attained through his poetry of nature and daily life in his native Lake District. In the end, Manning was prevented from exploring China as he dreamed of doing, but he did develop an ingenious method for studying Chinese society through the analysis of jokes, which he published a decade after his return to England. Among all the lighter productions of a literary people, there is nothing from which we can with such certainty gather their real opinions, humours, habitual feelings and popular manners as a current jest book. On the face of it, writing about jokes might seem the most unwordsworthian idea imaginable. But Manning explained that jokes provide a shortcut to understanding popular sentiment. Jokes that circulate widely are effective only because the notions they imply are in fact commonly held. For example, English jokes about the scarcity of honest lawyers were popular because the opinion has been, and probably still is, that the law does preeminently nurture and develop a man's knavish propensities. Apologies to the lawyers in the audience. 
Manning suggested that such opinions are in themselves a matter of fact, a branch of the history of the human mind. His assertion that the opinions and humours of a people are in themselves a curious object of inquiry echoes Wordsworth's own views, and this was radically democratic in the early 19th century when ordinary people did not even have the right to vote. Um, but leaving aside metaphysics and sociology, um, the book's major contribution to human knowledge is its breakthrough in our understanding of Thomas Manning's love life. Uh, Manning never married, um, and there had only ever been one reference to a romantic attachment. This was spotted in 1959, um, 1957 as it says there, um, by Frederick Beattie, who edited Manning's correspondence with Charles and Sophia Lloyd. Um, praising Sophia's letters, Beattie observed, um, in her chatty letters are preserved many intimate details that might otherwise not have been recorded. Twice, for example, she mentioned the only woman, a Miss Williams, in whom Manning is known to have taken a serious interest. And this is Sophia Lloyd, and not, not Miss Williams. Um, but the, the identity of Miss Williams was a complete blank. Unfortunately, at first glance, the new archive didn't appear to mention her either. But the archive did introduce a new mystery, um, which was a new correspondent Manning addressed as Mr. Wilkins. At first, I thought this might be the famous architect, William Wilkins, who designed the National Gallery and University College London. And, but it in fact turned out to be his father, um, who was also called William Wilkins. But this Mr. Wilkins was 20 years older than Thomas Manning. In 1807, after Manning arrived in China, he wrote to Mr. Wilkins and included some small presents, seeds of exotic plants and some Chinese pencils. I am sure they will not have the less value because of the hand that sent them. You will easily guess that I foresee what fair hands will sometimes use them. I don't think he meant the hands of Mr. Wilkins. Mm -hmm. um, when he wrote back, he gave over most of his letter to his three daughters. Um, the first reply was from Emma Wilkins. You know, my dear sir, how much we value anything that comes from you, but your letters we prize and esteem more than if you sent us all the rubies from the East. And when they fail, we shall attribute it to the winds and waves or to anything but for forgetfulness, as our motto is do not fear. I am your truly affectionate friend, Emma. And then the playful postscript, at your return, you will find that our dear mother looks as well as ever and her daughters a little the older. There's a definite strain of Jane Austen um, in the scene. Um, Emma Wilkins at the time would have been 26 years old. And the Miss Williams letter from Sophia Lloyd is in the Wordsworth collection at Cornell University Library. Um, mm. When I belatedly applied to see a scan of the original, I was pleased to find uh, my suspicions confirmed. Um, and it was immediately clear to me that Frederick Beatty had misread Williams, uh, had misread Wilkins or Williams. Um, the letters between the Lloyds and Manning never use Miss Wilkins' Christian name, but the evidence suggests that Manning courted Emma Wilkins, the second sister of William Wilkins, the architect, between 1799 and 1801, when she was between the ages of 17 and 19, um, which was a usual age, a usual age for marriage at that time in the, so the social class. Um, and while the courtship was unsuccessful, uh, Manning clearly remained on good terms with Emma and with her father. Um, she never married, um, but her youngest sister did actually marry um, one of Manning's friends from Cambridge, who was Robert Woodhouse, the mathematician. Manning was often, it was often said about Manning that if he had graduated from Cambridge, he would have been second wrangler in his year, which meant he would have been the second best student. The first wrangler was Robert Woodhouse, who married the sister of Emma Wilkins. Um, so on that romantic note, I want to 
I'm going to stop. Um, and again, thank you all for coming and enjoy the book. And we do have lots of refreshments upstairs. I please, please, please enjoy, enjoy them and enjoy yourselves. And thanks again for coming. I've really got nothing to add to that, except that uh, mere sinologists, this, these revelations about the private life of Thomas Manning come as, as uh, quite a surprise to all of us, yes? And uh, to reiterate that uh, there is plenty to eat and drink upstairs, as I have checked out myself. Thank you very much, Ed, for a wonderful talk. And, and uh, I hope you all buy perhaps even more than one copy of the book. Thank you. <laughs>